Hello and welcome to Castle Talk, where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror Anthology. Tonight, we're chatting with Keone Waxman, writer-director of The Ravine, which is released in theaters and on demand and digital from Cynodyme on May 6th. Welcome, Keone. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Fantastic. Okay, this movie... Uh, it stars Eric Dane, of, uh, that we know, who we know from Grey's Anatomy and Euphoria, and Terry Polo, who I always think of as from Sports Night, and Peter Facinelli. And uh, it's mainly about Eric Dane and Terry Polo as they sort of reel from this violent act, this murder-suicide that has occurred in the home of their close friends, as they try to mm-hmm. put together what happened and why and, and so forth. Uh, is this so? Tell me where you you wrote and directed this picture, but uh, mm-hmm. you're basing it on a on a book, or is it a true story, or both, or what? It is both, and basically, where it, where it comes from is I was brought a book, a novel called The Ravine, a few mm-hmm. years ago, and um, it was brought by uh, producers I always work with, generally to do more action oriented stuff and whatnot. And they said, hey, you got to take a look at it. And I read it, and I was like, okay, this is pretty is pretty interesting. It's a thriller. It's about a murder, you know, suicide. But what was really cool about it was that it was written from the point of view and it was written by um, people who were friends of the family, friends of mm-hmm. friends of this incident. And really, what it was is. It was written by two people who we depict in the film who knew these people and knew this incident. And really, they wrote a novel not about what happened, but they wrote it about sort of the collateral damage of being there. And how do you deal with being feeling guilty, feeling this, feeling that? I could have stopped them. Anyway, it turns out that the people who wrote it were also the ones who wanted to turn it into a movie. So I met mm. them. And Bob and Kelly Pascuzzi, who Mitch and Carolyn, uh, Eric, Dan, and Terry Polo are based on. Um, and they were fantastic. And really, I realized when I met with them that it was really a, a, it was a process they were going through to heal. And I realized the collateral damage from this murder-suicide was so powerful that they've been struggling through this the whole time. And what they decided to do was turn it into a book and turn it into a movie. It was brought to me for that, and I thought, hey, you know, this could be a great thriller, but, you know, I always do these movies that are plot-driven, you know, you know, the get bad guy saves the girl, the good guy gets, you know, yeah. this, the bad guy saves the good guy saves the girl, the bad guy never saves the girl, but... Um, no, you never know, but, but uh, still, yeah. You never know, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but to, but in this in this case, it was not about that at all, it was about people who, you know, who were trying to struggle to figure out what happened, it was an internal conflict, and I thought, you know what, with what I do, and with what this book is about we can make a really interesting and different kind of thriller and that's sort of that that was the genesis of the genesis of the whole thing it, al- it almost plays like a murder mystery except for that that you you're, you're pretty certain sort of the who done it it's more of a mm-hmm. why and 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 it's a why done it exactly and even you know the, the other thing that strikes me watching it is that depending on what kind of movie you're talking about. If you're talking about like, you know, The Wrath of Man, the new Guy Ritchie thing where Jason Statham mm-hmm. kills a bunch of people or, or, or a horror movie like Halloween, right? In those, death does one thing. Death serves a purpose. It's, death is basically a speed bump, right? Mm-hmm. In a movie like this, what you've done, it shows that death happening in our immediate social circle, it isn't like that at all. You know, death or, or a few deaths sends out these vibrations, these these atomic waves that affect us for weeks or months or even years in ways that mm-hmm. that normal thrillers don't actually touch on it's it's very different and i and, and i'm glad that you brought that up because the idea was to try to do something a little different set it in new orleans that's not where the original the novel was set mm-hmm. uh, i was trying to make sure that we actually were able to say look this isn't just you know uh, this isn't about a personal sort of journey as the book was it's trying to say mm-hmm. look this is something that's universal because it's a little bit more leaning you know lean to the genre but really and again instead of the plot point being you know uh, wh- why the characters do things this is the characters are creating the plot point and like mm-hmm. you said it's a why done it and the why isn't always as cut and dry and it's sometimes sometimes as much of a mystery if not more than you know your traditional genre approach wow uh you mentioned filming in new orleans and, and it's funny i've mm-hmm. seen a few films made there. Why, why do you think people choose to film in New Orleans? Well, you know, there's a number of reasons. And, you know, uh, you, you can go from one in the spectrum of, of the affordability because of tax credits and crews and this or that. Oh. You go to the other end of the spectrum of just how unique and, I mean, there really isn't another city in, in, in the U.S. like New Orleans. You know, there's, yeah. there, you can't say that about a lot of cities, but there's really nothing like New Orleans, not just because of the music, not just because of the history, not just because of the location, but you're also dealing with people who, you know, the, the people of New Orleans are the most artistic and, you know, most passionate people I've ever met. I shot there 15 years ago. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I vowed to come back, um, never came back to do a film. 
um, you know, shot all over all over the world, never came back there until this film came up. And when I got the book and I saw, you know, it's based upon, again, it's based upon the collateral damage of, uh, of a, of, you know, of a murder suicide. I thought, you know, how do you make it cinematic? New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And then going back there, ironically enough, you know, a third of my crew were the same people I worked with 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. So the idea was that you come back and it's a, it, it's a place that never changes, even though it's always changing. Right. And that's kind of what happens when, when something like this happens to you. You know, everything feels stagnant and the same, but everything is absolutely different. Well, and, and it, New Orleans gives you this wonderful, like, texture when they're when mm-hmm. you know when the mm-hmm. family when the, there's flashing back to the families before the crime happens the families mm-hmm. are hanging out you know in the afternoon drinking beer and playing around in the backyard and th- the trees hanging over them and all the shade and there's just this texture that you don't really see uh anywhere else if you're just shooting in a backyard Absolutely. you know you know, it, it, the, one of my favorite scenes in the film is when Eric's ca- uh, character goes to see someone who was a witness at the murder. Mm-hmm. And he goes to see this great actor, Stephen Graham. But um, he goes to see him. There's a two-hander. And it was supposed to be they just talk at his apartment building. But, of course, we're in New Orleans and we're scouting. And I come across this, where my, my location manager takes me to, this incredible compound. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, the, the only way I can describe it when I got there is like, it was like, like the woman who lived there was Tippy Longstock. You know, <laughs> I expected to be a cow on the roof. You know what I mean? Like, I don't remember, you know, that movie from years ago. But it was, oh, yeah. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Was there, yeah, because her, her dad was a ship captain in her mind, and he collected stuff. Well, her father was a musician, and he owned a bar, and the entire place was this incredible trove. And I walk in, and there's a sign that says something. And you're like, okay, you know, there's something about this that's so New Orleans, it's so perfect. So we decided to shoot it there. The day we get there, it starts pouring rain. Nice, warm, tropical rain. Look out for the lightning because you're in New Orleans. Yeah. And we just said, you know, we're in this great spot. Let's just set it outside. Let's not go indoors. Let's not run for cover. And let's use the rain. And, you know, the two guys, they play this scene totally understated. They're, they're, yeah. they're, you know, they're not being direct about what they're asking, but they're about as direct as you can be. And yeah. it, to me, it's so New Orleans. I mean, it's just so like sitting there watching the river go by, but you're saying volumes without saying anything. Yeah, it's thick. It is. It's it's thick with uh, with atmosphere. When you yeah, and that's, you what the, take, that's what that location is. Yeah. Well, when you take a, a book, you know, so somebody hands you a book, you you're reading it, and you decide, okay, I need to turn this into a script. Mm. Is do, you know, scripts follow a logic of their own, right? That 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 yeah. you know, you, you either know really well or you don't, but. You, Almost any casual moviegoer knows scripts have like beats and, and they, they mm-hmm. kind of know when you're coming towards the end and, and yada, yada. So what, how hard is it for you to take a big 200, 300 page book and go, all right, how do I turn this into 100 pages? <laughs> of, of, yeah, well, of you know, it, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head. The, the, and it's not just that. It's also with a book, you're talking about, let's say, 30 chapters. Yeah. You're talking about you can cut back and forth in time, and you can come back and forth in points of view. It could be a diff- One chapter could be from a whole different character's point of view. And that yeah. all flows because we're used to that, and it's all in our imagination. Then you take that and you try to apply it to, a, like you said, a script, a three-act structure in 90 pages. It, yeah. It's daunting. I mean, it's really closer to series where like an hour episode is five acts. You know, you fade right. out, you fade up, and, and then you talk about what happened when, you know, when the camera, you know, when it, it's a commercial break. It's yeah. an easier way to approach something like this. So, yeah, it, it's daunting. But what's cool about it, and especially with something like this and what we did with the ravine is – because you're saying, okay, we're going to go from the character point of view. That means that the characters and their backstories is important as what's happening in, in you know, in, in the present day, but it's also the ju- juxtaposition. So yeah. I was able to keep a, a, a chapter structure by saying, you know, well, you didn't know him like I did, you know, and, you know, then you cut to something else. It isn't like your classic dun dun dun, but it is where you slide in and maybe the texture, like you said, the texture on the wall, same as where we left. Maybe the music on the jukebox is suddenly the same song, but it's, you know, 20 years earlier. All of those different things actually help you with it. But then you're also, you know, then you're also going, okay, so what do I not use? (laughs) Um, And a lot of it is implied. You know, I, what I always do is I just, I take my pen and I, and I underline all the things that I like about it. And Mm -hmm. then you make a list of that, whether it's an order or not, and then you move it around so that it fits more in a three act structure. And then you can say, oh, I need to flash back here don't want to do flashbacks and i need to make that a present day comment or at least memory you know of you know uh, a character's actions are very different than a character's words right yeah. so you know when you when you have somebody saying stuff and you know everybody says show not you know show don't say but really the juxtaposition of the character says how he you know says talks about himself and talks how he thinks he sees himself where the character's actions are really how he is and yeah. so that juxtaposition you either hide from it or you lean into it and you go okay so i'm going to have somebody talking about the past maybe but really it shows that this person isn't to be trustworthy or or, or whatever the case is. 
So, you know, the novel gives you, you know, adapted novel gives you a, a wealth of stuff to play with that you normally wouldn't when you're just trying to do it in a straight linear fashion. And today, let's face it, just about everything is nonlinear when you're watching from a commercial to, you know, to uh, a movie true. out there right now or a TV show. You yeah, know? I the, mean, I the nonlinear fashion of, being able to... I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying people are used to it, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so the... Uh... The film is The Ravine. It comes out May mm -hmm. 6th from Cinedime. I've been talking to Keanu Waxman. Uh, it stars Eric Dane, Terry Polo, and Peter, Peter Facinelli about uh, where Eric Dane and Terry Polo are a married couple um, trying to figure out and make sense emotionally out of what happened in the violent death of their close friends. Thank you so much for discussing it. I hope you have a fantastic release. And this was really a blast. I really appreciate it, Jason. It's great talking to you, man. Really great, great talking to you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Okay. All right, bye.